Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 61 of our podcast, and this is our first ever live podcast recording. We are recording at a video game con in Parsippany, New Jersey. Um, so, first of all, thank you for coming to our podcast, audience. <laughs> There's hundreds of them, guys. They're real. Yeah. They're real. They're real. people here. Actual people listen to this show. Um, and this episode, given that we are at a video game con, which uh, we covered a little bit last year in a previous episode, but it's a wonderful little convention where folks come and set up vendor tables and buy, you know, art, retro games, you can collect and get all kinds of stuff, as well as a free play room with arcade games and lots and lots of TVs with little consoles set up and you can play all kinds of rare, obscure retro games and uh, get to either relive an old favorite or try something new. And so this episode we wanted to talk a bit about collecting and collections, but more about why. Yeah, and not to be confused with collectathons, which are a type of game that we've covered in a previous episode. For your ban- you banjo kazooie fans out there, there's a previous episode. You can go listen to that one. Yeah, um, and also Jeff and I both have different dynamics for this because Jeff is currently with his lovely spouse, an incredible collector of games who has a ton of stuff. I, however, have a handful of Switch games, some PS4 games, and my PS2 collection is the only thing I still have because I sold a ton of mine off. And it's really fascinating to walk the show floor here and see, A, a ton of games I love that I remember playing, and then a ton of games that I'm like, what the F is this thing? What is that on the box art? What that, kind of game is this? Well, that's one of my favorite things about doing this. Uh, there's a lot of like services nowadays where you can pay a monthly fee and you will get sent video games. Video Games Monthly is a great example. You, have, you put your games into a database and they will, every month, send you a certain number of games for the systems you specify, and they will never send you duplicates. Huh. So that's a really great way to expand your collection and maybe even find a new favorite, because you kind of get a grab bag situation. I think you can even specify the sorts, the sorts of games you like, genres. So, you know, you can always do, it's sort of the, like, I like all kinds of music except country and rap. I like all video games except sports games. <laughs> and so you can specify those sorts. But for me, One of the reasons I haven't already pulled the trigger on that, because I've known about it for ages, which is why I can speak on it, is I like coming to conventions like this, I like going to tables, and I like thumbing through the games. I like seeing a game going, ooh, I like that, what's the price? Let me wander around, now that's in my head, let me see it again. You mentioned, uh, well, earlier today we were looking through games, you saw the Tasmania game, Escape from Mars it was, Uh on the Sega Genesis. Now, I was vaguely aware that that game existed. I know there's all kinds of Looney Tunes games, whatever. Like, I couldn't have named it. I was like, yeah, there's got to be a Taz game on the Genesis. You mentioned it. And I've seen it everywhere this whole day. (laughs) I found it 12 times. I counted. (laughs) Yeah, uh, that is one of the hardest Sega Genesis games I've ever played. But it's also one of the most beautifully animated sprite art game I've ever played. And like the power-ups that Taz gets, he can grow and shrink, and Marvin the Martian, I believe, is the villain in it. Like, well, he's escaped from Mars, it has to be. Right. But Foghorn Leghorn has taken over Mars, you've got to fight him <laughs> off. I mean, it could I, be. I say this red planet seems very nice. <laughs> but well, the thing is, about a convention like this, like thumbing through old games like that, like I immediately remembered struggling with that game. I immediately remembered how it sounded, how it looked. like. And that's something powerful to collecting, especially in video games, that I don't know uh, collecting other medium might have. I mean, I'm not a book collector. I'm not a movie collector. I'm not a music collector, unless it's digital, um, at this point anyway. Um, But the thing is, with any of those, there is something very nice about having a physical collection and being able to lend it out to people. True. You know, a lot of us have e-readers, Kindles, and things like that, but you can hold on to a couple of those favorite paperback books that, you know, you want someone to read this. It's way easier to hand them book one of this, you know, long-running fantasy, fantasy series that you love. You know, you can give somebody a Discworld book, but it's kind of hard to, like, send them the e-reader version. You can, but you want somebody to listen to a certain album, watch a certain movie. That's a little easier, you know, torrents and everything. But with gaming... One of the reasons that, like, I, I get digital games, and there are definite games that don't have physical releases, and I'm not going to deny myself those games just because. Right. But if I can get it physically, I will, because I have, um, 
For, for audience members here who haven't seen it, ask me after we record. I have some pictures of our setup at home. I built custom shelves. We have over 800 physical video games. We have a. We live in New York City and have a physical library. And I think of it as a library because it's something that if people want, to, like if friends want to come play video games at my home, I love being able to pull those out and share them and have that tactile experience to look through the instruction manuals where we have them. And when other people have those systems to go, here, play it for a while. Bring it back when you're done. I, like, I'm not going to miss this game for a few months. Like, if you want to run, like, uh, what you're saying with over 800 games, you won't miss that one game that you lent somebody. It depends on the game. If you take <laughs> Symphony of the Night, I am going to track you down over it. That's true. Yes, yeah. it is one of my, one of my favorites, perennial. Um, but yeah, no, and you having a physical collection has actually been a benefit for me as your friend as well. Like, um, you, yeah, when you when you uh, met, met up to, uh, you know, we carpooled down to this convention, you returned my copy of Shantae Half Genie Hero for the Switch. Which I got in the day one edition. Which I had been wanting to play for ages and kept saying, oh, I'll download it, oh, I'll download it. But when Jeff had it, I was like, oh, can I borrow that for a little bit? And he's like, yeah, sure. The reason I know that Shovel Knight is a fantastic game is because Jeff lent it to me on my, on his 3D, on my 3DS. I played it for exactly a half hour and went, I need to own this, gave it back, and then bought it on the Switch as soon as I could. Yeah, and it also works in my household, especially for handheld games, because uh, my wife is also a very avid video game player and video game collector, and some of her favorites are handhelds. And because of that, uh, we have two Switches, we have two 3DSs, because that's the only way I'll get to play them. So. It's, yeah, it behooves us to have a physical copy because if you download it digitally, it's only on one of them. Yeah, and like, and that's something that I do miss, like the blockbuster era, which I'm sure many of us remember. Like going to blockbuster and picking out a game that you wanted to play. Like I, the reason I know such obscure games on the Sega Genesis, for example, is because I went to blockbuster and they had Vector Man. I went, ooh, what's that? It looks like a giant green Mega Man, and it's since then one of my favorite Sega Genesis games. You don't really get that experience now. Like I bought Bayonetta on the Switch. Bayonetta is a perfectly fine game. I played it on too high of a difficulty. I wasn't any good at it. I got stuck. Now I don't want to play it. I want to return it. I can't. I mean, most games, physical copies too, you can't return, like once the seal is broken. But with a digital game, you can't even give it to somebody or lend it. It's just in your library. You don't even have to download it, but you have it forever. Yeah. And I, and I also wouldn't argue that digital collections aren't collections. Of course they are. Like, however you collect games, you collect games. But there's something to physically collecting things that allows you to share the experience that you can't, at least right now, with digital games. Yeah, it allows you a certain, yeah, no, you, you can kind of rehome a game. Yeah. You know, you can, you know, I don't care about this game. I don't even want money for it, but, oh, you're interested in it? All yours. Please have it. I mean, I've donated to the Jeff collection just from consoles that I've gotten rid of. Oh, um, yes. Uh, there, I would say roughly a quarter to a third of that collection is from friends who... Just give you games. Well, because they aren't holding on to their retro games anymore. There's nothing wrong with them, but and, and they still game. Yeah. But it's just like, this is... You're going to give them a better home. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, you know, you have that friend who has so many cats, and you find a kitten. They're going to give that kitten so much love. <laughs> you know, you can't give that kitten a good home. I am a crazy cat lady when it comes to video games. That's I'm true. very happy to adopt all of the kittens. That's, that's <laughs> truly fair. Um, as a collector, have you seen anything this year that you were like, oh my god, I can't believe I found this yet? Um, I've had a lot of fun with... So I, I actually have on the table right now a little, uh, little plastic bag, and all that is in it are PlayStation 1 demo discs. Um, in particular, from PlayStation Underground, the quarterly digital PlayStation magazine with behind-the-scenes videos, developer interviews, download, save games for, for whatever, and demos, and there's codes for all kinds of stuff. On one of them, you can enter a code, and it's got a corn music video. Ooh, which video? I, I think it's got the lights. Yes, the like you want, Do you want to date existence? There is a PS1 Underground demo disc that has a corn music video. Like, that is a slice of an existence of a time. And that is why I love demo discs. And again, that's the sort of thing where downloading a digital demo is fun, but you're going to get rid of it or you get the full game and it goes away. But these are trapped in amber. Yeah. You're going to play the build of something or how much of it that they did. Sometimes it's the full game that they put a wall that you can glitch through. Oops, I paid a dollar and now I've got the whole game. Uh, or they're, they were part of a, a PlayStation magazine or something like that. It's a fun little bit of history that I really like. And that is one of the big things for me as far as video game collecting goes. 
I've uh, gone on record on this podcast, and I'll, and I'll say it again. I feel that preserving the history of games that have come before uh, is incredibly important because we have a lot of HD collections that come out and re-releases, and I'm all for those because the easiest way for people to play games that they love, games that they remember well, give it to them, please. Yeah. You know, I am an outlier. I have, I have all of those systems and have them all plugged in. Not everyone does, and not everyone should. So it's fantastic, but when we get the SNES online uh, on our Switch, we get 20 games on it, which, you know, just as of this recording, just happened, and I'm very excited about it. The SNES Classic, these things come out. We've had Sega Genesis collections release after release after release. Every generation, it is the same miasma of 45-ish uh, Genesis titles, right. maybe some Sega Master System. But there wasn't only 50 Sega Genesis titles. Nope. There were hundreds. But you are not necessarily going to find Tasmania Escape from Mars on your PS4 Sega Genesis collection. No. But it exists. It's there. Um, people have been talking about the, the, uh, the Disney collection that's going to be coming out soon with The Lion King and Disney's Aladdin. And I went on a couple of groups, and I think on Twitter as well, and uh, posted a lot of mock outrage that everyone was talking about the Super Nintendo Aladdin. But I was mad that they did not have the Game Gear releases of Lion King and Aladdin. <laughs> and I'm very lucky that I already had them because this would be <laughs> very unacceptable otherwise. <laughs> but they're games that, you know, they're forgotten, that they are left behind. And every good, bad, and different game is somebody's favorite. And it's really nice to be able to hold on to the physical artifacts of them because then you know it's yours. You know, media fails, hard disks fail, that's life. You know, books rot and burn, like, you know, things happen, but this is a way to hold on to it. And because there is no, there's very few video game museums. There are a few. Yeah. It's difficult to have a centralized repository of video game history. So it's kind of up to all of us. You know, however much or however little you want to, it's important to hold on to or get those games you, you, you know they're not good. You found it for $4 in the bargain bin, but it makes you so happy. Sure. It's, it's a release that happened that's probably not going to show up on one of those HD releases. And it is one that you are now its keeper. You are now its lore master. And you get to share your personal experiences with it, as well as a little bit of the facts. Because there's a lot of games that, like you said, you look through stuff on the table and like, what is this game? Like, what, what is this box? What is this font? What is this title? And I know a lot of games. I don't know all of them, and I love having that experience. And being able to hold on to some games, you don't have to have over 800 games. You don't have to have over 10 games. But if they're games you care about, and they're games you love, then that's a great way to preserve them, and it's a great way to share them with people. Sure. I mean, for me, the way I feel like I am a collector is my accessibility. So, like... I had this weird rule with the Switch. I would only buy digital purchases that were multiplayer games. That way, if I brought my Switch somewhere, I could share those multiplayer games with anyone else I was with. We could play them together. And all single player games had to be physical because I like physical games. They're a solo experience. I only need one at a time. That rule didn't last very long. A, certain digital games are, that are single player are only available digitally. And then also I got Fire Emblem Three Houses, which took 50 hours to finish. I still haven't finished. And another single player game, Spyro Reignited Trilogy, came out, which I really want because I never played the Spyro games. So I threw the rule out the window and got Spyro digitally. I've accepted Fine. that I will never finish my backlog. <laughs> it's such a good problem. I mean, and also think about that. Like, as a collector, like, we all have Steam libraries, right? That we have... Hundreds of games we will probably never play. Think, think of that number. Think of that number of games you haven't finished, you haven't even played. It's higher than you think. It's okay. This is a safe space. <laughs> You're home. It's okay. But the, the idea, that's still a collection of games. And games that as long as it's not like the DuckTales game where they just revoke it and you can't buy it anymore. Right. Those are a ex- few exceptions. For the most part, a lot of stuff on Steam stays there and you can play it. But getting through a backlog is really hard. And I think what keeps me from becoming a collector again is the fact that starting is hard. Once once you've started, it's not hard. Once you've decided, hey, I want to collect, the first game you buy to build your collection, 
you're building a collection. But sitting there and looking at the lack of space you have or re uh, lamenting about what you've sold, that's hard. Like uh, starting a podcast for me was hard. Now I have four podcasts. It's fine. I have no life. It's fine. You it, it, admitting it's the first step to <laughs> right. having a fifth podcast. I know it's going to happen. Well, I mean, I'm already in talks to possibly do music podcasts, but that's neither here nor there. The, the, the point is, is that once you get going, though, I feel like it's so much easier, and there are a lot of roadblocks in collecting or participating in portions of the gaming community because we scare ourselves from like, like it has to be this way, right? Like you have to have these games or you have to buy this thing. And the reality is, gaming is whatever the hell you want it to be. If you like a thirty-year-old game that's trash, who cares? If you like it, it doesn't matter. I mean, like there are some moral places that some games go that, like, yes, those should not Don't exist. Don't get the Wisdom Tree games for the NES. Or this the Bible game for nothing, the Xbox. This is nothing against its content. It's actually the fact that the way they got around the lockout chip was uh, sending a shock of voltage to, like, bypass it. It damages your NES. Don't get those games. <laughs> Or get them. Don't play them. Right. They're very, they're very pretty. They don't look like regular NES games. That's a lovely conversation piece. But you know, I think that for me, the, that rule I mentioned earlier about my Switch titles, it also was a way, an excuse, if you will, for me to start collecting games again. Like I want to have these physical boxes for the Switch games, and the artwork is pretty, and I just I want to have them. And, and so this was my rule. And and that's and that's the important thing. Like have your rules, have your your setup, and have what matters to you. Yeah. Um, I, I love being able to collect something as complete as I can. Um, and collecting for things that you love, again, that idea of, you know, now you are a part of this community, you are a librarian of, of a part of gaming history, which is something very cool to think about, certainly for me. It's if, when you collect for the things that you love, not necessarily the things you think you should, you'll be able to speak better on them. You'll probably track down more interesting things about them. And the artifacts associated with the games are important because you can get a lot of retro titles now out of the box. And there's a lot of titles, NES, Game Boy, uh, early Genesis titles that came in cardboard boxes. And good luck getting them preserved. Good luck getting them even in passable condition. So you lose instruction manuals. And there's a lot of early Game Boy RPGs that if you try to beat them, if you try to get 20 minutes in without an instruction manual, you're going to sit there. Try to play the Final Fantasy Legend with absolutely no instruction manual. Good luck. If you, like, just pursue you, I... The internet exists, Jeff. No, the internet <laughs> exists, and, and that is the thing. Yeah. People are able to either put up scans of the instruction manual. People have put together game FAQs yeah. about these games. That is the reason we are able to play them yeah. in collections and anything else, because we are able to go back and have that information. If you found this in a basement, you know, you found this in like your in your grandparents' basement or someone just gave you a box, a shoebox full of games, and you didn't know word one about the game. I love that game. It's like it, it is one of the first saga games, and I love that series. I love the oddness, I love the system, it's great. But without an instruction manual, I'm just left going, what the hell do I do with this? Okay, I gave the monster some meat and now he's a skeleton? Is that better? Is that worse? Okay, now he's a pterodactyl. That's better? <laughs> okay, I guess. And it's it and something that I collect for that I know is not. I, I mentioned Game Gear before. Game Gear is the handheld system I grew up with. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not. I mean, I had one too, actually. It's yeah. just, it's fun. No, and it's, fun fun. and it's great that I'm, I'm getting games that I grew up with and games that I'd never heard of, and people are selling them for a song. Mm -hmm. I've got several shrink-wrapped in-box Game Gear games that were $10, and they're not even bad games. Right. It's like Donald Duck Deep Duck Trouble. This is the era when Disney Sega games were like oh, money, the best. and they are. Yeah. And... I'm happy to have those because now I have the instruction manuals. Now I have all those pieces, and it is a system that I will I will speak on till till I pass out. Like, and I'm happy to and, be that library. And he will. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned instruction manuals as like from the collecting side. That's something that frustrates me now. Opening a brand new Xbox 360 game, opening a Switch game, opening a PS4 game, and there's nothing in it. Maybe an insert for whatever live thing they have, and I. 
Who here remembers, with a show of hands, going to the game store with your parents, getting the new game, tearing it open in the car, and reading the instruction manual? That's what the car ride home was for. Um, it, th thank you. That, that was a lot of hands. Yes. Um, uh, and, and like, the fact that that doesn't happen anymore, like, also new game smell is a thing. Like, new book smell. And, like, it's just, it's not the same anymore without the instruction manuals. And, like, again, we don't really need them now with the internet, but still, I think the physicality of having it is, would be pretty neat. What I love that the Nintendo Switch seems to do, and certain other consoles have done in the past, is a lot of their box artwork is reversible. And the boxes are clear. So you can see the artwork if you open it, but you can also pull it out and spin it around. So we live in an era where we don't get the instruction manuals, but them covers them. Yes. And you know what? That's We live in a different world now. We live in one where the, the fact that we can have game FAQs about old games is fantastic. But at the time, we needed to have the physical instruction book. Sure. Now it's just go online. Go online. I want to throw an idea out there. Um, yes, I'll do you guys ever collect the... Um, the hint guides, because some of those are like art books. Do we ever oh, yes. collect the hint guides? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. I still have the Final Fantasy VII <laughs> white-covered, thick book. It's the reason I have Final Fantasy VII memorized. I also have the original player's guide. So that that I've collected just because I've kept over the years. I have the original Super Mario RPG uh, book, which like is, like Holly was saying, like an a work of art, like the way those sprites were designed were so different, like this weird mix of claymation and not, and like all of it is blown up on the page. It's the sprite work of polygons. Right, like pre-polygon yeah. polygons. But yeah, absolutely, like, I, and I think those are just as valuable if you're a reader and you like looking at that stuff, like there's so much information in it. We've talked in the past about strategy guides, we did a whole episode about it. There was once a Final Fantasy, what, nine, nine strategy guide that didn't have all the info in it. It was like the the early ages of the internet and they had a website where you had to get some of the solutions and they were trying to like push that and so Square told, I think it was Brady Games that was putting out the guide, hold back some of the info, we're going to have it on Play Online. It's going to be the best thing, yeah exactly, Play Online, rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> it's how you get on to Final Fantasy XI. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a beautiful artifact of a strange idea. And no, it, there's it's, also something satisfying I feel about playing a game with a strategy guide versus like just looking it up on the internet. Like I, I mentioned Fire Emblem earlier. I've done a lot of looking up on the internet for some of the relationship development, some of the strategies for the battles, and it's just less satisfying than like thumbing through a book and like reading up on whatever you had to do. Also, like there was a Mortal Kombat game that was in the PS2 era that had a story mode. I can't remember which one it was. The big shot of monks. It was Annihilation or something? Deception. It was well, Deception. Yeah, because you were the, the, the monk that like basically... Uh, Ruins the world. That was the one the Deception was upon. Um, but that game, I had the, the I bought the manual for it, and like one of my best friends at the time sat in the computer chair at my computer with the book open and game facts open while I played the story mode, and we navigated it together. And like collecting that kind of stuff allows you to engage in games in a multiplayer fashion. That's not just two people holding a controller. Oh yeah, and growing up as a little brother, uh, instruction manuals and strategy guides were a great way to enjoy the idea of a game <laughs> when your brother had the Nintendo in his room. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it, it, it is. Um, I, I've gone on record on this podcast and I'll do it again. Uh, one of my favorite NES games, Crystalis, or Crystalis. Uh, I still have the original instruction manual for it. It is in terrible condition, but it has all the pages. And it's one of those like big suckers that's taller than the NES cartridge itself. It's got like an eight page story about leading up to the game. It has little pictures and descriptions of every single weapon, armor, shield, item, spell, everything. It lists all the towns, it lists all the dungeons. And you want a sense of anticipation reading through that like, I remember being a kid and just thinking how amazing it'll be when I have the psycho armor, the strongest armor in the game. I didn't get that far in the game until I was like 17 and was playing it on emulators. I, didn't, I wasn't that good at video games when I was a child. Um, big surprise. <laughs> and it's still, I, I now can beat that game in an hour. And I still love having that. And I still look back on the little drawings and the pictures. And it's a piece of the history and it's a piece of that game. And it's something that... 
again, if someone wanted to borrow it, if someone wants to like look through that crazy piece of an, uh, of of that game, that experience, it's like yeah, look through it. You know, you don't have to sit down for an hour with it. Like, look through it, whatever. And that's a piece of the experience. It's a piece of the collection. That's a piece of history that I can share. And that's something I like to do. I want to pose a question to you, Jeff, just as someone who's a diehard collector, and I am clearly not, although yes, yes. I'd like to be again. Do you feel like the mass digital releases like NES Online, Super NES Online, the NES Mini, the Genesis Mini, which just came out, I think. Yes. Do you find that devalues your collecting, or is it just another way to collect? I find it's just another way. Because again, some people, you, if you want to collect, if you go to a panel or if you listen to people talking about like starting your own video game collection, like rule one, rule zero, set boundaries and goals. If you want to collect every single video game ever, stop. <laughs> Are you a billionaire? Stop. Uh, like just whatever. Uh, do you want to collect every single game for a certain system? Good luck, possible. Do you want to collect every single game in a certain series? That's possible. Do you want to collect, you know, do you want to collect a certain type? Do you want to collect a certain era? These are all things. You know, I have very few complete series that I like to collect. I have, the closest I have is Metal Gear. I have every, I have a version, a way to play every version of a release of Metal Gear and Metal Gear Solid titles. You know, I don't have every single thing that ever came out, but I'm able to play all of it. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> that's good. And that's where I put my value. It's one of my favorite series, and I love being able to just, you know, play the play, play Metal Gear Acid if I want yeah. to, to, you know, play Metal Gear Solid 3, whichever it is, and this and that. But having those uh, mini consoles, having those digital collections, it just means someone else has a way to play titles that they may not necessarily want to drop all the money on. You know, I occasionally will drop a good deal of money on certain titles because I value them. But also being able to spend the exact same amount of money as you would normally spend on a uh, loose copy of Earthbound to then get an SNES Mini, which has Earthbound, and another 20 games, like, what do you value in that? Right. You know, I already own a, a Super Nintendo, and it's like, well, why not get the cartridge? Well, now I have a thing that looks like the SNES has, like, a little baby. <laughs> Don't talk to me or my son ever again. <laughs> and I can, and this means it changes the value of, also when you go into collecting something, you kind of have to have an idea in your head of how much am I willing to spend on certain experiences? Are there games that I'm trying to reclaim from my past? Are there games that are fantastic, but they're rare, and I accept that, but I'm not just going to pay any price for it. You know, if you really like Chrono Trigger for the SNES, you know, if you say to yourself, I will not spend more than $60 on this, you may be waiting a while, but you've got that in your head when you're looking for it. And if you find another way to play it, I mean, it's not $60 to play it on Nintendo DS, even if you want to get it in the box. And that's a way to play it, and that's a way to have it. But does the value is the value in having the cartridge, is the value in playing the game. These are important. And again, it's whether or not you want to have that experience for yourself, or it's one that you want to share. I really like being able to have handheld re-releases of games because I live in New York City. I ride the subway a lot. I can play it anywhere. Sometimes people see what I'm playing, and that starts a conversation about what's going on. I never have more fun conversations than when I pull out my Game Boy Color while I'm on the subway. Because someone's going to see it, and they have all kinds of flashbacks. They have their favorite games, and I get to hear about their all-time favorite game, what game they played on that. You know, half the time I'm playing Pokemon, and that's already going to start a conversation. I, I, I replay it so many times, and it's so good. And there's something nice about having a handheld that takes two AA batteries, and if I play it uh, an hour and a half a day, like 45 minutes one way, 45 minutes the other on the subway, that thing will last two weeks before I need to change batteries. Carry a few extras, I don't have to plug it in. That is worth it for me. Way more than getting like a Game Boy Color collection for my 3DS that I will have to charge at the end of the day. You place value on different things, and it's not just a monetary value, it's a nostalgic value. Yeah. It's a sharing value. It's all of those things, all of those experiences. What do they mean to you? Sure. And what do they mean to the people you want to share it with? Whether family, close friends, complete strangers. Like all of us here uh, in this panel at this convention, we know some people, we're just meeting others. And 
it's really nice to get to see some games. And you know, there's people that are selling these games. They know these games. You see it, and you're like, what is this? They can talk about it, and you get to learn about it. And you get that experience. And you are, if you, even if you don't buy the game, you're collecting an experience. And that, to get really cheesy, that doesn't have a dollar value. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. No worries. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think, also for me, like, again, as someone who doesn't really collect the physical stuff, at least, I, I am excited to have the NES and SNES games on the Switch. I am uh, really excited now to buy the Sega Genesis collection that's on the Switch. Because then three of my classic consoles are on my Switch, which I can take everywhere. I'm probably going to get that just because I have a working Sega Genesis but some of those games are very expensive to collect for, and it doesn't matter to me to have the, the cartridge. Right. I don't have the same nostalgia for the Sega Genesis as I do for other consoles. Um, it's not one I grew up with. It's one I grew up around. It's one that several friends of mine had, so I played a bunch of those games. But it's just as worth it for me to get that collection. And then if I want to collect games outside of it, cool. Yeah. And I get the experience. Yeah, I think that um, what's really cool about being at a con like this, which this is my first year at a video game con, is seeing the overlap between collectors, sellers, and the kinds of conversations that are happening. A lot of the really great people I've met is literally because I'm wearing Bulbasaur on my shirt. And like someone who's in the panel today stopped me on the street because they like my shirt. I gave them a card and now they're here at the panel. Like, a, I feel like a smaller convention like this Focus on collecting is not, like Jeff said, it's not just collecting the games, it's collecting the experiences, collecting people, finding people you share a commonality with. You know, uh, we can do that a lot easier online, but like one of the things I hate about digital collecting is it also encourages digital play. And I like playing online as much as the next person if it's with my friends. I don't like playing with strangers, who does? Um, the internet sucks sometimes. But like couch co-op was the way I, we all grew up playing games and like, one of the things I like about going to Jeff's place is like we can sit on the couch, look at the wall, and go, oh, "I never played that game. Oh, let's play it," and then just play it together in the same space. Like Smash Brothers, I love Smash Brothers. Playing it online is fine enough, but the GameCube era when you played with four controllers on your couch—that's the definitive version of that game, and not just because it's melee. I like the newer versions of the game. I don't like that I have to go online to play with my friends because we're all scattered and can't be bothered to play on the same couch. It's, it's not a real game of Mario Party unless you are able to personally threaten the person <laughs> that is beating you. That's true. And like not just yell insult, but like you need to be able to personally threaten them. You need to know them. <laughs> this is important. This is Mario Party. Talking trash is less fun over the internet and can also get you into trouble. It but talking trash in person with your friends is way more fun. Especially when you're Jigglypuff and all you do is the charged up spin attack constantly all over a flat stage till people die. You need to be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even that good with Jigglypuff. That's the annoying part. <laughs> um, to be fair, I'm a, I'm a game and watch me, so I want to talk. So I'm a little curious of the folks in our audience. How many of you are avid game collectors? So there's something I posed, and we should be able to pick you up on the microphone. Or if, 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 you, if you want up. to come up, or we'll turn it around, and you can come up, or whatever it is. What do you consider your most prized possession, and why? Like, is it just because it's rare, because it's worth $300, or is it because it's the first video game you ever played? Like, for me, if I still had it, my N64 and Super Mario 64 would be my greatest possession, and I'm, I regret selling it. Because I, it, it was my bar mitzvah present. I had to wait to get it. It was, it was pre-ordered out the wazoo, so I couldn't just walk into a store to buy it. I called Toys R Us. They didn't have it in stock. Well, they had it in stock, but they were all pre-orders. And I asked my dad, can we go anyway? We go in. They used to have this little counter at Toys R Us with all the video games in a cage in the back somewhere. And I walk up to the counter. I go, hey, do you have the N64? And the guy goes, oh, I'll go check in the back. It's like, yeah, we have one. And Mario 64, do you want it? Oh, my God, yes, I want it. And, like... That help, and like that car ride home felt like four hours because it, and it was probably ten minutes because I was it was the first console I remember anticipating coming out the first console I knew was hard to get and then I got home and the euphoric experience of turning on Super Mario 64 for the first time a 3D Mario game that has never been done before and something I've been waiting for for months like there's very few video game experiences that have led up to that Super Mario 64 you can buy on the floor for ten bucks probably. So it doesn't have a ton of value monetarily, but that has a lot of value to me because of the life experience attached to it. 
it's context matters a lot. And that is subjective as far as your experiences, and it is also the context of the environment of which the game came out. There's all sorts of titles and games that have come out that you look at them now and you go, what's the big deal? They mattered at the time. And it's really interesting to be able to kind of to, to, to time them, to place them, to, and to have all the little bits and pieces that go with it. Yeah, if I were to buy a console that I used to own, an N64 and Super Mario 64 would be the first thing I buy. So now that I've stalled for all of you, I pose the question to you. What do you find really valuable in your collection and why? You asked two questions. Sure, yeah. Um, I can say one of the games that's really, really valuable in my collection. Um, let, me, let me preface it with, the only games that are in my collection are games that are good. Okay. Uh, I've played through them. Uh, I like them. Mm -hmm. That's why they survived me walking past them and not looking on the shelves and saying, no, 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 you got to go <laughs> because you're a piece of crap. So um, I collect for game. I collect games that I truly enjoy playing. I love the series and so on and so forth. Um, the most valuable game in my collection would be Panzer Dragon Saga. Sure. Right yeah, totally. Um, and it's an amazing game. I, I, also mentions like collecting like, certain series. I think with the exception of the Game Boy, uh, the, 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 the game, excuse me, the uh, Game Gear version of Panzer Dragon Saga, I've played and completed every Panzer, Dr Panzer Dragon uh, game. So I, I, I do love that. Um, and it's part of me. Uh, sure. Again, you know, I, I, I love video games. Uh, I, I come look for things that might be interesting, um, but you also mentioned the, the, there's a bit of a, a cost involved yeah. with this. Oh yeah, yeah. And and space is precious. Space is precious, <laughs> absolutely. I, I from, I've had purges on my collection. You know, I, I get a new version of it and I go, I don't need the old version anymore. You know, uh, we, I, I have Final Fantasy XII, the Zodiac Age on the Switch. Do I need the PS2 version anymore? Not necessarily. No, that's true. Very cool. Now, now, if there was one game in your collection that you would want to like basically be the herald of, you know, like I want everyone to be able to play this game. I want you to try this game. This is, you know, this is my, this is my hill. Do you have one in your collection that you would want that would be that for you? Because it doesn't need to be the best game or the greatest game, but it's the one that you. There are a lot of nice PlayStation Two games. Uh, another game that I truly like, didn't get a lot of uh, really early PS2 uh, two game, uh, is um, you, um, Dropship. Okay. All right. Now, I, I actually don't know that game. Very few people know of it. It's a really, really good game. Uh, and if I could share it with everybody, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't second it. Um, that would be that that would be the one. My there, no, that's the awesome. Library. That's that's yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things I like about, we, we, I, I feel like we've been very down on the digital age. And one of the things that I love about the current digital age is Twitch and YouTube. Because it is a way for people to experience games that, you know, a day one release of a game. I'm not going to spend $60 on every single game the day they come out. You get to experience the game a little bit. Uh, people will stream retro games. And it's a way to, to you know, to put dropship on on Twitch, on the internet, whether you make a YouTube video of it or anything like that, I'm not saying you should, but someone might and someone probably has in some way. And you can go and experience it in some fashion. And that is a way that we can be a, a, a booster, a cheer squad for whatever game that we love. Um, does, it, does anybody else have another, uh, any I'll thoughts on any of these questions? I'll share. Excellent. Uh, Hope this uh, is picking uh, everyone up. We'll okay. see. All right, cool. I have to say my favorite, like my most personal, like out of my whole collection, has to be Resident Evil 2. Mm -hmm. I spent, I know you could beat the game in like possibly like three hours. First time, maybe like 10 hours. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. I speed run the game when I first got it, you mm -hmm. know? So, like to me, I I have my friends watch, like if they never played it, I'm like sit down and watch a movie because that's how I'm going to play it. Enjoy it. Yeah. You know, you're not spending no more than like two hours. Now. Right. No. Uh, and the experience of the game is so B rated. I love it. I grew sure. up on horror. 
the whole aspect of it being the original being inside mm -hmm. and the second game starting you off in the city you know you get it's a little taste of what the, the game's world is offering i get that feeling every time I sure i can never get bored that's Re amazing resident yeah. evil oh, let's turn that around resident evil 2 is actually one of the few games i watched at least eight times before i ever played um one of my closest friends we used to hang out all the time and play games together and he was more of a player i was more of a watcher especially came to horror games because i am a wuss i'm so easily scared and so i remember us playing that game and like the first time that um what's his name the the mr mr, what, x? mr. mr. x comes mr. X. bursting through a rule all right in front of you like i screamed so loud so high pitched. oh yeah and like a big trench coat looking <laughs> but the fact yeah, absolute that, units just <laughs> but the, the the fact that I had someone with me who also jumped made me feel safer to play those scary games. It's why like I will never play a Five Nights at Freddy's game, but I love watching them online because they scare the hell out of the person playing it and me at the same time. But it's a communal thing. It's an experience on top of an experience. Yeah, and yeah, game, game. You know, you read a book. You can't like read a book at the same time as somebody else. Easily. <laughs> um, you can watch movies together, you can discuss movies together, but games are to be played and games are to be experienced and it's, and it's great that we have platforms and ways that we're even able to join in on that communal experience even if we're not in the same room. Yeah. And, and I think that like at the end of the day, at least it seems to me the things people prize most in their collections are games that either have a very personal experience to them or something that they're proud to share with the world. And, and I think that's something that's really great about gaming is like the, the people who really love gaming in any facet want to share the things they've played that are great because that's like as nerds, that's what we want to do. We want to talk to other people about the things we love. Yeah, there is, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's only fair that I answer this question we post as well. And my answer for the game I value the most in my collection, it's not even the most expensive, and the game that I would be like, I'm a booster of, is Intelligent Cube for the PS1. And that has, it's, it's not a game for everybody. And that's the thing, like it's, if you're into that kind of game, it's amazing. It's a puzzle game. And it is, it was a game that I had the demo for, that I played over and over and over and over. And then I was able to finally get it. And it's such a strange, weird little experience of a puzzle game. You know, it's got cubes, and you got like a little polygon guy running around trying to eliminate these cubes. The rules are simple, but it gets very difficult very quickly. The graphics, there is just a black, endless void behind what you're doing. The music is very orchestral, and it's just this strange, wonderful experience. It's one of those games that you can't quite describe its aesthetic, but it's entirely itself, and it's shaped like itself. Intelligent Cube is shaped like Intelligent Cube, and it's cube spelled with a Q. So you could have the IQ, uh, and it was one of those games with a PS1 title that had a lot of very odd commercials as well. The commercials would be people uh, winning spelling bees or writing physics equations on the board, and then a giant cube just drops on them. And then it, like, I don't remember if there was any, like, voiceover saying anything about, like, you know, I think you're smart enough or something, but it did that, it showed the gameplay, Intel Cube. <laughs> so... That is sort of my game that I love being able to share with people, love being able to tell people about. There's other games that I do as well, but certainly a nice little, it, it was part of my collection that, I had, I had quite a video game collection as a kid that I sold most of in college. Because I was dumb and I needed the money. That's and, same. and I started building it back up. And there's a lot of games, certainly for my PS1 titles, that I'm very, very mad at myself because Einhinder is so expensive now. And Intelligent Cube was one of those games. It's like, I set a value for myself. And that was like, a, I will spend $60 or less on this. I waited a long time for that. And it, I found it for $50. I got it. It's back in my collection. I still, I get to play it again. I plan on streaming it soon. It's because it's a game that I love as part of my library and I will happily be a historian of and share with as many people as want to hear about it. 
Yeah, I, I, I mentioned Mario 64 before, but I think of the games that I still have, because I still have some of my PS1 games and a few of my PS2 games, I think the one that I value the most that I have currently, besides Chrono Trigger, because it's the best game ever made, but that's enough of that, um, is actually The Bouncer on PS2. It was one of Squaresoft's first games on the PS2. Mm -hmm. It was a side-scrolling, or 3D, so, pseudo 3D beat-em-up game with the beta version of Sora with actual sized limbs, because that's what he looks yeah, like. Yeah, you look at the design, yeah, it's proto-Sora. And like, it's just, it's it's an okay beat-em-up game, like as far as beat-em-up games go, but I, I just, I love this stupid game. It's just ridiculous anime aesthetic. Like, what if Final Fantasy VII had a beat-em-up baby? Essentially is what this game is. It's like, what well, if they took Air Guys, God bless the ring, and made it a beat-em-up? Right. Yes. And so, like, I think that's one of my most treasured possessions and one that I'd want to share with the world because not a lot of people know now that Square Enix made a beat-em-up game like that. They never made a follow-up. They haven't made other games like it. It was kind of during the period when Squaresoft went, we can make any genre game. We are amazing. We made Final Fantasy VII. And you know what? Half the time they were right, and that's annoying. Yeah. I mean, also... Uh, now they're making tons of stuff with the release of like the Tomb Raider games that they're publishing and all well, of that. I mean, they're publishing a lot of stuff. Right. But but this this is just such a weird game. And so if you have a PS2 and you've never played The Bouncer and you can find it, I highly recommend it as long as you're patient. Yeah, and it's, it's probably not going to be a very expensive no. game when you find it. Again, it's one of those uh, everyone puts their value on games. I think I actually saw a copy of it here for like 10 bucks. Yeah, it is not a, a high cost game, but it's definitely one that is just a, a, an interesting piece, it's an interesting time capsule of the PS2 era. You know, much like um, one of my favorite games, Devil May Cry. The original Devil May Cry is so that era, late 90s, early 2000s, between the heavy metal music, the way Dante acts, like. It didn't age well. It is tsunami as hell. Yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, but you know what? Uh, and then we, 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 we've asked the room and we put it to all of you. What are some of the games that you wish you had in your collection? What are games that, you know, money, no object. What are the games you want to collect? What are the games that you love either in your collection or in your past that you want to share with people, that you want to share with your fellow gamers, with the world? Yeah, if you're listening and you, you know where to find us on the internet, and we're going to tell you in a minute anyway, but please comment with your favorite game, what your collection I would love photos of collections, bookcases filled with games. Comment on Facebook with that. Like, I love seeing those setups. Um, as big or as small as you want. Like, if your entire collection is just a single shoebox full of games that you absolutely adore, that, that's that, a collection. That's a collection. It's a valuable one. Yeah. Um, you can, of course, find us on shirtpov.com along with all the other podcasts on our network, on anywhere you find podcasts. If you have five minutes of time, please write us a review on iTunes. It helps us to get featured. I like to think we're a five-star podcast. We're maybe three-star humans, but definitely a five-star podcast. Um, and, of course, you can find both me and Jeff streaming on Twitch. We're trying to do it more and more. Um, you just recently made affiliate. Congratulations. I did. Thank you very much. I celebrated by playing Super... Thank you. I celebrated by playing Super Mario World poorly. Uh, I forgot how bad I am at that game. I mean, I love Mario games, but, like, literally walked off cliffs into lava multiple times in the same place... On the same stage. It was so funny. It, 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 it's fine. So it's sorry. fine. Um, but, of course, you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on any podcast platform. Um, we, you can also email us, funandgamespod at gmail.com. We love hearing from all of you. Thank you to everybody who came to the podcast live and being in the room with us. Thank yes, you for th being here. Yeah, th th this, uh, we're, we're, we would have been happy with, like, one person in the room, and a bunch of you came. We're very happy about this. Thank you to a Video Game Con for having us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is a conversation. Thank you all for being a part of it. I'm Jeff Moon. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And happy gaming. <laughs>